morning, church. T today, Pastor Peter Chen will share the message from the book of Genesis, chapter 37, verses 1 through 8. I will read in Haitian Creole, and Brian will read in English. Um, you can follow along on page 27 in the pew, Bibles in front of you, or on the screen above. Hear the word of the Lord. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their fa father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. Jacob, mais Jacob était dans le pays Canaan, côté papa qui était passé toute la ville. Mais histoire famille Jacob là. Joseph était un jeune garçon, 17 ans. Il était gardé mouton à cabrit ensemble avec frère Petit garçon Bilal à Zilpa, femme qui papa lui. Il était con rapporté par papa toute vie bagaille yo t'a fait. Israël même te remet Joseph plus passe tout l'autre petit lieu. Parce que li te fin grand moun, le Joseph te fait. Li fait yon bel voyage, long avec manche pour lui. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. Le fwel yo we, Jean papa yo, te remen Joseph plus passe yo, yo point rayil. Yo pa trouve l'ouvri bouche li, avel, ni san yo pa joure li. Yon jou, Joseph fe yon rev. Li raconte, li raconte by fwel yo, by fwel yo li. Ça te fait yo rail plus toujours. Mais le yo, messieurs, tendez yon rêve moins fait. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. While your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it, his brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Mwen mwen nou nan tout, nan tout tan, jaden, chak moun tap mare yon paket zeb. Paket mwen an rete kon sa, li kampe tout doat pou konte li. Epi tout paket pa nou, yo fè wont li. Li vin bese tèt de vam, palan tan kou moun yap salve. Fwe yo l di, aha, ou vle di ou pwal chef nou, ou pwal komande nou, yo te vin rayil, plus toujours, peut-être rêve l'ité dio li fer. This is the word of the Lord. All right. Good morning, everyone. I am glad and proud that you're here despite the, the football game that I know is happening in a couple hours. Is that right? Is there a football game today? Or is that next week? Okay. So I'm proud of you that you're here. It's going to be a long sermon. We're going all the way to 3 o'clock, so you'll miss the kickoff and people stand up and leave. I'm just kidding. Um, this is also the first Sunday of the year that we're celebrating, so we're celebrating a new year, but not just a new year, but a new decade as well, so just let that sink in. Um, I can barely remember what happened like yesterday or last week, much less what's gone over the last year, much less the last decade as well, but thank God for Facebook. Facebook actually, um, you know, it shows you on this day and those kinds of things, and so Yesterday, I got a notification from Facebook that um, one decade ago, 10 years ago, on the 4th of January, was when my wife went in for her mastectomy to have her breast cancer, the first part of her treatment for breast cancer, 10 years ago to the day, which was also the same day that we learned about Jonathan. We learned about Jonathan when, he went in, when she went in for surgery. The surgeon was our, you know, um, let us know about the pregnancy. And so that was 10 years ago yesterday. And so much has happened since then. Three children and across the country and a new church and all this different stuff. And when I just realized how much God has brought us through, um, 
it just, it, I was so deeply thankful. And it made me thankful even for the harder times, because the harder times uh, accentuated God's goodness. And that's what hardship does. When everything is going good, we have this tendency of saying, everything's going good because it should go good. This, I just had a good day. This has been a good week. And we just kind of limit it. But I think hardship has a way of reminding us that God is holding us. And it accentuates his fingers more. And there's more contrast to see him. And so I would encourage you, whether it's Facebook or some, some less social media thing, to just reflect on your week, your year, even your decade. Because when we reflect on that, that's when we see God. That's when we see his fingers. That's when we know what he's doing. So I encourage you to do that. Um, we have a lot going on as a church. We've got a fitness challenge. We've got the annual meeting come up. But for this month in the sermon series, what we're going to do is do something a little different from the month of January. And I wanted to explain it as we get into it. About a month ago or so, we were praying as a staff. We have a weekly staff meeting where we pray both for one another, but we also pray for um, the prayer requests that come on those orange sheets of paper in front of you. And that particular week, what stood out to me was that every single prayer request that we were lifting up had something to do with family. Every single one. There was one person whose mother was um, kind of declining in age and they were struggling with what do we do? How do we take care of them? You know, you're not prepared to take care of someone who's, who's declining mentally and physically, so we prayed for that person. Another person whose extended family member was going through a terrible divorce that just made us kind of silent with the pain of it. Another person who was struggling with the prospect of their family coming to town and the sort of laughter coming out of that, the, the, the stress that came out of that, and they were struggling with that. Another person whose, um, whose child was having a really hard time with anxiety, and they didn't know how to, how to deal with that. And it was just over and over, every single prayer request had something to do with family. And it made me think that it'd be so good for us to think about family as a church, because if we're honest with ourselves, so much of our pain and concern, but also our joy has something to do with family, something to do with parents, brothers, cousins, uncles, children, grandparents, whatever it might be. And so I thought it'd be good for us to take one month just to talk about family and to see how scripture and how the word and how Jesus can help us to understand family better, but also how to live out different ways of family to transform our patterns of family and how we uh, pursue family relationships. And the way we're going to do that is by looking at the story of Joseph and Jacob in the last part of the book of Genesis. It's a really complicated story. There's a lot of twists and turns to it. Now, if you don't know it, you'll have to really kind of concentrate throughout it. But the key root of this problem, the key issue that lays at the heart of what we read in Genesis 37, comes out of verse 3 and 4, which we read this morning, which said this. Now Israel, who's also named Jacob, loved his son Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. The technicolor dream coat, that's the same story that we're talking about right here, right? When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, They hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So understanding Genesis 37 all comes out of here. It comes out of Jacob preferring one son much more than any other and giving him special gifts and treating him much differently. And as a result of that, the other brothers begin to despise Joseph to the point where finally they conspire to kill him and in a a merciful sense, they sell him off to slavery to Egypt. It all comes from this. All this drama, all of this rage, all the, the slavery and everything that will come out will come out of this one issue, which is favoritism. The favoritism of Jacob to Joseph and excluding and pushing out all these other brothers. All these other brothers to the point where they hate him and they can't stand him. And I think this is something that maybe some of us are familiar with. We've seen this in our family somewhere as well, the, the problem with favoritism. That's the root problem here, that Joseph is a favored son who is treated better than all of his brothers. It's key to understanding what's going to happen in Genesis 37. But the key to understanding this problem actually requires us to know a little more about this family. Because it's not just about Jacob preferring Joseph. There's a certain reason why he prefers this child. And it has to do with Joseph's mother. 
and who his mother is. And we find out who Joseph's mother is from Genesis 37 where it says this, Jacob had 12 sons. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. But then the sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. And so this is who Joseph's mother is, Rachel. And the reason why that's so important is because if you know the story, you know that Jacob far preferred Rachel to any of his other wives especially to Rachel's older sister named Leah. We see this in Genesis 29. It said Leah had weak eyes, which we don't know what that means, but it says Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful, and Jacob was in love with Rachel to the point where he's going to work seven years to marry her, and then when he gets tricked into marrying Leah, he's willing to work another seven years to marry Rachel. He really prefers, loves this woman. And this is key to understanding the preference that he has for Joseph, right? That is not just the story about Jacob and how much he loves his son. Oh, he's so cute. We get along so well. We have the same interests. Because that preference actually goes back one generation. He prefers Joseph because he preferred Joseph's mother, who is Rachel. And so it's not just an issue between father and son. It's an issue between, fa- or between a father and a mother and then the son. That preference actually kicks back one generation or one level in this family. But really, to understand this, we should go even further back. This favoritism, this way of living that we find in Jacob of favoring people goes back even further to Jacob's mother, Rebekah. Jacob's mother, Rebekah, is carrying two sons. And while she's carrying these twins, she hears this prophecy from the Lord. In Genesis 25, it says, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be the stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So she hears this prophecy about how her two twins are going to have very different paths, and one will be more powerful than the other. And what we read is that these twins grow up, and Esau, the older, uh, became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved the older son Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And so we realize then this whole idea of preferring one son over the other isn't just something that Jacob decided to do with Joseph. And it's not even just something that happened because he loved Rachel. It was the way he was raised. He was raised this way. He was raised in a family where he was the preferred son because he was going to have authority and power and his mom would love him and actually manipulate circumstances so that he could have more power. But he'd also be an unfavored son. His own father would not favor him. Why? Because he couldn't hunt game. Because of these ridiculous reasons, because of a prophecy, because of meat. He's not preferred, and he is preferred as well. And we realize that what he does to his wife, what he does to his sons, is the same way that he was treated as well. The key to understanding Genesis 37 is not Genesis 37. It's understanding what comes before it. It's understanding who comes before it. It understands how people are treated. It's understanding that it's a pattern that he's living out, not simply a decision that he has made. Not only will Jacob's actions in Genesis 37 come from the past, but they will continue to affect the future. Because this favoritism towards one son will not be limited there. It won't remain there. Because if you know the continuing story of Jacob and Joseph, Joseph gets sold off into slavery, right? And he becomes actually quite powerful. He's a gifted man. And so he becomes the viceroy of Egypt, the second most powerful person in Egypt behind the Pharaoh himself. Through his giftedness, he actually saves Egypt and all of that region from a famine by storing up grain. But his family back home, Jacob and his brothers, they're starving. And so they're forced to go to Egypt to buy grain to survive. But little do they know that the person that they're buying grain from is their own brother, their own brother Joseph. They have no idea that this viceroy is the same brother that they sold off into slavery, but Joseph knows. He recognizes them still. When he sees them come to buy grain, he does something really interesting. He plays out this drama. And it's kind of, it's hard to figure out why he does it. He's like yanking their leg or he's punishing them. But what he does is he says to them, 
kind of in disguise. He says, I don't know you. And I don't know if you're going to come to overthrow me, if you're a spy coming to take my power. And so I don't know who you are. And so to make sure that I can trust you, I'm going to take one of you hostage. And before their very eyes, he takes the second eldest son, Simeon, and binds him, shackles him right then and there, and says, your brother is my hostage. If you want him back, go back to your family, go back to your father, bring back the youngest son, because I know you have a youngest brother. Bring back the youngest brother to redeem this other son. And then I'll know you're of good faith. Then I know I can trust you because you'll be willing to do that. And so these brothers, Reuben and the other brothers, are forced to go back to their father Jacob and they retell this news. This man has taken Simeon hostage and he demands that we bring back Benjamin with us so that we can know, we can prove ourselves, we can get Simeon back. Reuben is an incredibly honorable figure throughout this story. He is the one person who does not want to kill or even enslave Joseph in Genesis chapter 37. And in this chapter, what he says to his father is, I will give you my own sons as hostages if anything befalls Benjamin. If any harm comes to Benjamin, you can kill my own sons. That's what he says to his father Jacob. Jacob's response is that he says this, My son Benjamin will not go down there with you. His brother Joseph is dead. He's the only one left, not of my sons, but of Rachel's sons. If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. This favoritism that we find him giving to Joseph was not limited to Joseph. It's not like he had to get it out of his system, you know, where he's like, oh, I love this kid, and he loses him, and he says, oh, I've learned my lesson. No, he didn't learn his lesson. He'll then extend it on to the next son of Rachel, which is Benjamin. And even... If he has a son who is bound in captivity in Egypt, he is not willing to risk the life of Benjamin. Remember, Simeon is his son. This is not from someone else's family. This is his own son. But he's not willing for Benjamin to even travel. And he's willing for Simeon to remain a hostage and even die if it means that Benjamin will not come to any harm. This is not an isolated thing where he's going to have this one time where he's going to lose his mind and have complete favoritism over one son. No, he's going to continue to live that out. Continue to live that out and pass that on from generation to generation, from one son to the next son. And if there were one more son, I guarantee he would continue to do that again. That's the key to understanding the book of Genesis and the story of Joseph and Jacob. It's not seeing a conflict between brothers or the favoritism of a father to a son. It's seeing how it arcs backwards from generation to generation, how it goes back to a wife, and it goes back to a mother, and it goes back to the way that he is raised in that culture, and how it will continue to affect his life in the future and and dictate his decisions and what he does and what he says. That's the key to understanding the book of Genesis chapter 37 and what comes afterwards. But it's also the key, I think, to understanding our own families. And all the dynamics, all the situations, all the crises that we see in our families' lives, I think it's to realize this. The issues that we see in our families right now, they all have some root in the past. They all have some root in the past. And how we deal with our family in the present will inevitably come a root for the future. You see, oftentimes when we think about our family, we think about them as like this knot that we've got to untangle. Have you ever untangled a really bad knot with fishing or sewing or whatever it might be? You're hyper-focused on that thing. You're like, okay, this goes here, and this is the issue that we see. And when it comes to family issues, we tend to focus on that family issue as isolated as the one thing I've got to figure out. I've got a problem with my dad, or me and my siblings do not get along. My mom is sick. My cousin is going through this. And we tend to think about them as this one isolated issue. And we do that because it's a big issue, but also because Americans, we actually don't like to think beyond the nuclear family. We think about parents, kids, and that's where generally our attention tends to lie. So when issues come up in the family, we tend to think about them as, oh, it's an issue between me and my dad. We got to hammer this out. That's the cause. It's me, it's him, that's the end of it. What the book of Genesis shows us is that very rarely is that the case. 
More often than not, any situation, any dynamic, any issue that we are experiencing has some connection to something else. To the things that we go through, to the cultures that we are raised in, to the things that, the, the, the things that have happened in our family previously, that the connection goes back. That it's not one knot, it's a knot that's tied into a rope that's tied into another knot that goes back. And what you're experiencing and the tightness of that knot right now is probably being tightened by what came before it. And that's what makes it so difficult, that it's not just an issue into itself. It's an issue tied with another issue. And not only that, the way that we deal with that issue the way that we try to untangle, the way that we deal with our parents or our siblings or whatever it might be, will have a ramification in the future as well. We often forget that. But in the same way that the past is affecting our present, the present will affect the future as well. It's visualizing our families not as having this one isolated issue, but to seeing issues and dynamics as interconnected with one another. Your issue right now is connected to something else. It's connected to an experience, it's connected to a person, it's connected to a culture, and then it will affect something else. The way you try to untangle it, the way you deal with it, might tighten or loosen the knots in the future as well. This, I think, is the understanding of family that we get from the book of Genesis, and it's a powerful one. It's a powerful one that transforms our understanding of what family is and how do we navigate it. Three reasons why I think it's so important that we see family issues as interconnected, as ropes, rather than just one knot that we've got to figure out. The first is this. It exposes the deeper causes of those issues. It exposes the deeper and the true causes of those issues. Think for a moment why um, Joseph's brothers hate him. Why do they hate him? Is it really anything that Joseph himself has done? Maybe a little bit, because he is an annoying guy. From the beginning of Genesis 37, what's the first thing that we hear about, uh, about him doing? He tells on his brothers, right? He goes and he says, you know, he gives a bad report to their dad, like, oh, these guys were not, they're working very hard. That's the first thing we hear about Joseph in the Bible, is that he tattles on his brothers. And then he tells them this story about a dream, like, I had a dream, guys. And he knows what this dream is about. He's, he's not faking. He knows that dream is about him ruling over them. He says, I had a dream that my sheaf of wheat was high and you guys were all bowing down to me. What do you think it means? See, he knows those kind of things, right? He clearly understands this stuff. He's an annoying, annoying person. But that's not the root of the hatred. That's not why they hate him. The hatred that we read in verse 3 and 4 has nothing to do with Joseph. It has to do with the father. It has to do with the robe. It has to do that they could see that he loved Joseph more than them. It had to do with the father's actions and not the son's actions. But they looked at Joseph and they said, Joseph, you are the problem. We need to kill you because you're the problem. What did Joseph do? Joseph wasn't the problem. And even if they killed Joseph, would that stop the favoritism in the family's life? No, it wouldn't, would it? Because then it's going to go to Benjamin ultimately. When they focus on the wrong person and just that one issue, that one not, they're actually overlooking the right cause, overlooking the true cause, which is their father. It was their father's behavior, the father's unfairness, which caused the strife and the bitterness that they were experiencing. And had they for a moment looked beyond this and maybe listened to Reuben and said, wait, Joseph's not the problem here, it's our dad. Joseph's not doing anything. He's annoying, but he's a younger brother. He's supposed to be annoying. It's the father. Our dad is the one who causes us to hate this brother. And then Jacob has to ask himself, why do I do this? Why do I have all of these sons, and why do I prefer one or the other? Why does that happen? And then he has to think about his own childhood. He has to think, no, it's not just that Joseph is a nice kid. He's got nice kids. It's because he was raised this way. He doesn't know anything else ultimately. The same applies to our own lives. So often we're trying to unpack and figure things out, aren't we? Trying to figure things out with my brother. Man, we don't get along. Or with this will or whatever it might be. And we get so focused on this, sometimes we're fighting the wrong battles and we're blaming the wrong people. We're like Joseph and, their bro- and our brothers. We're bickering, we're arguing, we're, we're insulting, we're accusing one another. And we don't even realize the problem is not here. It's one level back. And I think sometimes we have to recognize that. 
Spouses, you have to recognize that. Sometimes you're not even arguing with each other. You're arguing with your mom. (sighs) Just let that sink in. (laughs) For you unmarried people, one day you might know. But that's how it is. You're having a conflict with someone at work? You might actually be having a conflict with someone else in your family that you don't even know about. And thinking about our lives interconnected helps us to look past, past that one moment to what the true causes might be. The second reason why this Genesis understanding of family is so powerful, it helps us to give ourselves and others grace when we can't find any. When we can't find any. Um, There are many despicable characters in the book of Genesis. There really are. But the one that I hate the most is Jacob. I can't stand this guy. I really can't. From the very beginning... I mean, he's, you know, tricking his own brother. He doesn't care about his own wife who has borne him all these children. He's just this trickster. He tricks his uncle. He's running away from his uncle. He's tricking his brother. He's just tricking everybody. He tricks his own son. He gives him, you know, gives him different stuff. He's just a, he's just a bad guy. Like, no one wants to be friends with a person like this. He's, he's really not a great guy. And so when you think about this, just if you just read Genesis 37, there's no grace for him, Right? What is wrong with you? Why do you do this? Don't you see your sons are going to kill their brother? Not because of what the brother has done, because of you. You're the enemy. You're the villain in this kind of situation. And if we read Genesis 37 and we just stopped it and just closed off our understanding right there, Jacob is a clear villain with no excuse, with no excuse whatsoever. Until you look back to Genesis 25 and you realize he doesn't know anything else. He's never been raised any other way. He himself was raised as a favored son whose mother doted on him and cheated her own son. Remember, Esau was the same twin. They were born minutes apart. She was willing to cheat her, his brother for the sake of, of a prophecy. He was not beloved of his own father. Why? Because his father liked meat. Have you ever heard of a stupider reason to like one kid over another? It's comical, but think about if that was your life. If you knew that your own father didn't like you because you didn't hunt well, you didn't play games well, you weren't a football player like your brother, you didn't get straight A's like your sister, then it's not so foreign. Then it's just right there for us to see. You realize this is the way he was raised. He was raised being a loved son and an unloved son for reasons that made sense, for reasons that made no sense. He doesn't know any better. He wasn't treated fairly. He wasn't treated knowing how children should be treated. He treated his sons the way he was treated as well. And just for a moment, when you look beyond Genesis 37, this moment of grace creeps in. We realize, yeah, he is immature. He is a trickster. But he doesn't know any better. He really doesn't. What example has he seen of fairness before this? The same thing applies to our own lives. When we deal with issues with our family, grace is hard. Grace is really hard. How many of us have gotten into a fight with our siblings where we're just like, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're 100% wrong. And I'm 100% right. That's just how it is. It's math here. (laughs) You can do that with your kids, do it with your grandparents, your spouse, all these different things. It's very easy to have these situations arise with our our family where we feel like, no, I have no grace for you. I'm sorry. No grace whatsoever. I cannot see or, or respect you anymore for whatever reason, what you've done, what you believe, whatever it might be. In those moments, I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, when grace is just in such short supply, one form, one source of mercy is when you remember what that person has gone through. My, my childhood was pretty crazy. It was pretty crazy. A lot of crazy stuff happened. And a good part of my life, I've lived in trying to figure that out and blaming my parents a lot for what has happened in my life. But the moments that I find grace where there seemed to be zero, the jar was empty, was when I remember that they were born in a country that was occupied as a colonial power. They were born in a country where we were forced to take on a different ethnic name. They had Korean names, but they were forced to take on Japanese names instead. 
They were persecuted for faith. They saw World War II. They saw the Korean War. They know starvation. And when I think about that, and I think about how, oh, they didn't say I love you as many times as I would have liked, or those kind of things. Yeah, it's, it's hurtful. It's traumatic in some way. But grace begins to creep in where I remember their life, and I remember their experiences. And that's not a, that's not a small thing. That's not a small thing. Seeing people as connected to something else, to other experiences, to cultures, to things that are good and bad, helps grace to creep into the cracks of our lives. Helps us to have a little mercy to our family members when maybe we can't do it any, any other way. The third reason why I think um, seeing family issues as these interconnected things is so powerful is that it reveals the true consequences of our actions on the future. I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but there's like maybe a situation in your family that's been brewing, it's been getting worse, and you just decide to drop the hammer. You're going to drop the hammer. You're like, that's it. I'm going to use my outdoor voice now, and you just kind of let it go, right? And you're just screaming. You're like, you did this, and you did that. I never want to see you again, and you just kind of let it all out. And when that happens, Oftentimes, we'll go back and we'll say, they pushed me over the edge. It was a long time coming. This is what happened. And that what happened. We have a lot of different ways of understanding this. And we just kind of, we just blast through it. We blast through it. But seeing our families as interconnected reminds us that what we do in that moment will actually have a reverberation in the future. It will actually affect something else. That the way that I talk to my kids, even for a moment, even in jest might actually shape how they view life itself. It's happened before. I've seen it happen before. And you've seen it before in your parents' life. One thing that they've said, where they lost their patience, they had a tough day, they were working, and you asked them a question, and they blew up, how long did you carry that for? 30, 40 years? Your entire life? When we realize that our lives and our families are interconnected, we recognize everything we do in the present will affect something else. Everything we do is not just, oh, I'm just going to blow up, everyone will forget it. Not everyone will forget it. And the effects will not be limited or or isolated. They will reverberate in the future. What that does, it gives us pause when we have no other reason to stop when we feel so upset and so self-righteous that we're just going to pound through this, the one final jerk on the reins is to say, but what about the future? If you yell at your kid this way, what if they see you differently? What if they don't see you as a safe person in the future? Are you willing to pay that price? And there's one final break on that avalanche to say, are you sure you really want that? That is precious. That is a precious thing, to have one moment of introspection, one moment of pause when you recognize what your actions might do in the future. It's another reason why this is such, such an important way to see families. Not just as isolated events and isolated conflicts, but as ones that come from the past and ones that will shape our futures as well. Even just for a moment, think about the issue that you're going through with your family. Not work, not church, not friends, but in your family, right? Conflicts that you're having, even good things that might be happening too, right? That family's a source of a lot of good stuff. Just for a moment when you think about that face, that experience, whatever it might be, go beyond it. Instead of seeing it as it's not that, oh gosh, this is so bad or whatever it might be, think about what came before it. Think about what created that knot. Think about what's tightening that knot and making it so hard to untangle. Think about the way that you untangle it, recognizing that maybe if you untangle it a certain way, it will make the future easier or it might make the future harder. Just for a moment, visualize, think about your family in this Genesis 37 way as connected both to the past but also to the future. This is a powerful way to understand family, a powerful way to understand family. And I encourage you to try to visualize, again, your family's life as this interconnected rope rather than these isolated kind of things. It might give us insight, but it doesn't give us a whole lot of hope. Not in my mind. Because even if you understand something better, it actually doesn't give you a different way of approaching it. 
right? You can say, I was traumatized as a child. That's not being healed. You can say, my dad lived this way. That doesn't make it any easier sometimes to get along with him. We need a different way to live, a different way to break free, different ropes to live out, trading in the old ropes where we're yanking on the past and the future and seeing a different way of living out family. And fortunately, we have that. We have that when we look at this same idea through the life and the ministry of Jesus. Because there's an incredible parallel with what Jesus will do and who Jesus is. This entire time, we've been talking about favorite sons, right? Favorite sons create rage and murder. Isn't that what happens with Cain and Abel? That Cain doesn't feel favored and he wants to murder his brother? Joseph looks favored and so his brothers want to murder him? Favored sons create hatred, bitterness, separation. That's what we've seen. But when you think about it, Jesus is also a favored son because we read that kind of exclaimed loudly all throughout the Gospels. For example, in Jesus' baptism, just imagine a dad, not God the Father in heaven, but a dad, okay? Where in the baptism, he says this, you are my son, I love you, I am pleased with you. That's the dad paraphrase of Luke chapter 3. That's what he shouts out at the, at the baptism of Jesus. It's like at the graduation where they specifically tell parents, please do not clap until every name has been called. And you inevitably get that one dad who's like, whoop! He's like, out of nowhere, he just kind of, you know, shouts, right? That's Jesus in this situation. He's like, whoop! That's my son. I love this son. I'm pleased. You should listen to this guy. Even when he's born, if you go back a little bit to the, to the Advent story, he sends a chorus of angels. He's like, you guys sing about this child. It's like having a choir to come to the hospital to sing about your son being born. He really loves his son. Transfiguration, another proud dad moment. This is my son. I love him. I'm pleased with him. You should listen to this guy. You know that a parent really loves a child when they're like, listen to this son. You know what's funny? <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but I will. When I became a pastor... My, my parents were not happy. I was supposed to be a doctor. It was very clear. Um, it was written in the stars, but I did not. I became a pastor. And my mom was not very happy with me. For years, she would barely talk about my life and what I was doing. The, <laughs> the moment I knew she was proud of me was when she told my brother, you should listen to your younger brother more. That was the moment where I was like, oh my gosh, that's like, you could have said I love you and it wouldn't have been as impactful as knowing that you want my siblings to listen to me. And that was, that's kind of like what I hear here. He's so proud of Jesus. He's like, listen to this guy. You should listen to how much he knows. He's so smart. My son is so smart. You should know, you should hear this. That's favor, right? That's favor. That's belovedness. Matthew 12. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. Favor, calling, purpose, love, belovedness. That's what we see in Jesus. The same story. In the same way that Joseph was favored, Jesus is favored. In the same way that Benjamin was favored, Jesus was favored. In the same way that Jacob himself was favored, Jesus was favored. And we know what happens with favored sons. We know what transpires when one son is favored above all else. That creates separation, creates hatred, it creates murder, it creates sin. That's what happens when we know about favored sons. But Jesus will take this understanding of being the favored son and he'll invert it. He'll transform it because through this favored son, we all become children of God instead. We all become beloved through this beloved son. John 17 says this. He prays this before the cross. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in, may be in them and that I myself may be in them. He says, I'm beloved of you, and I'm here to make sure they are beloved just like I am. He takes that belovedness, and he says, I want to make sure everyone else is beloved. That's what belovedness means to him. When we read in John chapter 1, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of husband's will, but born of God. This child makes us all children, not further away, but closer instead. Ephesians 1 and 2, in love he predestined us for adoption to sonship and daughterhood through Jesus Christ. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. How beautiful is this? That throughout history and through our own lives in the story of Jacob, we read about how favorite children and the favorite child always create separation and bitterness with other children. But in Jesus, it's flipped. We get a different way of living. That in Jesus, the favorite child is how we all become favorite, child of God, favorite children of God. This is an inversion of the story. That no longer is favoritism used to make separation between people, but Jesus takes his favoritism, lays it aside, and offers it to everyone else. And through his favoritism, through his belovedness, we all become beloved. Because he's the favored son, we are all favored children of God. God looks at us in the same way that he looks at Jesus. And he says, I love that kid. I'm pleased with that kid. You should listen to them. Sometimes they say some really funny stuff, or not funny, smart stuff. That's the same way that Jesus feels about us because of God's favor on Jesus himself. This is a different way of living. It breaks free from Cain and Abel all the way to what we see in our own families. It's seeing belovedness as something that we already have, not something we have to earn, and something that we pass on to others. It gives us a way to put down the old ropes that we had, of being yanked by favor and giving favor and just living out this broken system and instead we have a new rope. That rope is to understand this. Through Christ, we have all become beloved children of God. And like Christ, we are called to use our belovedness to invite others in turn. This is our rope. This is the Christian's way. This is our way as believers. It's not to live out the ways we've lived before where we understand that some people are up in our family and some people are down and there's distance and we got to prove ourselves, is to recognize that through Jesus' belovedness, we're all beloved. We have nothing to prove. In the same way that Jesus uses his belovedness to invite other people, that's what we do. That's the Christian way. That's the Christian rope. That's how we affect the past and the future, is by recognizing you're already beloved and giving that freely to other people. We live a different life. We live a different pattern, breaking free from what we've seen before all the way to the book of Genesis. We live a life where we are beloved and we extend belovedness instead. That's why I think celebrating the Lord's Supper today is a great symbol of this because it's through the body and the blood of Jesus that we become the family of God. It's not through what we merit. It's not because we're so good. It's because Jesus traded his favor so that all of us could have favor. And now we can extend favor to other people. We don't have to play favorites. We don't have to put one person over the other. But instead, we take the love, the belovedness that Jesus had, and we extend it out to others. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for each of you, Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant which is in my blood. Do this, however often you drink of it, in remembrance of me. Just for a moment, I'm going to ask us just to prepare our hearts for this sacrament, to take it soberly, but also to recognize what it represents, that it represents us breaking from our old ropes and our own patterns, breaking free from what we read in Genesis and what we've seen in our own lives. We are beloved, and we're beloved because of this body and because of this blood. And then our calling is not to take that belovedness and to lord it over others and see ourselves as more favored of God, but to extend that to all who are around us, that all would know that through Christ they are beloved as well. Let's do that in a moment of prayer and reflection. I'm going to ask the worship team and those who are serving the elements to come forward first. Let's pray together.